Hey everybody, how's it going? Let's talk about your home recording studio. Today, oh boy, am I excited about this one. We are gonna build a computer today. A friend of mine uh, on Recording Rebels got a hold of me about selecting a computer uh, for home recording. And as we got to looking around at pre-built stuff, um, we kind of arrived at the notion of, hey, why don't I build a computer for you? I enjoy it. Um, and also that allows us to kind of select the parts uh, to really tailor it to his needs. So I'm probably not gonna frame this as much of a build guide. Uh, you know, I'm no pro. I've built several systems and I'm certainly tinker a lot in my own systems, but I think there are way better people out there on YouTube to learn uh, how to build a computer. Uh, from, uh, so take a look at Bitwit, at Jay's Two Cents, at Linus Tech Tips, Greg Salazar, Paul's Hardware. They're all great resources. They've all got some build guides available and they'll give you kind of a step-by-step. -step. I bought the vast majority of these components uh, from my local micro center and I, it, I just lucked out. It happened to be the week of Thanksgiving and they were running all of their Black Friday um, promotions and everything. So I, I was able to save a fair amount of money on these. So the prices I quote here may or may not be relevant to you, especially if you're watching in the future. Some of this stuff may be way cheaper uh, down the road and some of this stuff may be just not available anymore. So I think our requirements for a, an audio workstation is it's gotta be powerful enough to do what you ask it to do and it's got to do it quietly. That I think that's one of the big separations between something you're going to have sitting right next to your live microphone, <laughs> your super sensitive large diaphragm condenser microphone, and you don't want that noise just be getting picked up on every track and stacking over and over and over. It'll get really annoying really quickly. Uh, a couple of other requirements for this build. One, we're looking for long-term reliability. Uh, my friend uh, he's not a computer guy, he's not a computer tinkerer, and we want to put something together that's just going to work, and it's going to work for a long time, for years. And also, um, he wanted a small form factor build. So this is going to be my first micro ATX build. So we got a small chassis and uh, took that into account when selecting the parts. My belief, and the, the way that I always approach it, is I start with the processor at least for an audio workstation build. Now, if you're building a gaming rig, you might want to start with the video card since that is definitely, especially these days, going to be the largest investment, the most expensive component. You're probably going to have to choose your video card first and then see what else you can fit in your budget around that. For an audio workstation, I firmly believe pick your processor first and then that will help narrow your choices for things like motherboards, RAM, and it just it, it, everything starts to fall into place after that. The processor that I chose here, and I'm not sure how well you can see that. I'm trying an overhead cam thing here. I'm not sure how well it's gonna work, but I went with the brand new 12th generation of Intel. Uh, this is their i7 from their Alder Lake series. This is a 12 core. They're kind of mimicking what the Apple Silicon M1 does where they have some cores are performance cores and some cores are efficient cores, power efficient cores. So I'm really curious. Uh, early adopting things is always a little risky, I guess you could say, um, but I have every confidence this is gonna be great. I think this is a great choice. We wanted to go with the latest generation, again, with future proofing in mind. Uh, hopefully that will buy us an extra couple of years of longevity uh, to where the CPU is you know, still a prime workhorse and not outdated or overwhelmed by the workload. So once you get your processor selected, that will directly inform you of what your options are for a motherboard. And in this case, for 12th gen Intel, the chip, one of the chipsets, I'm not sure if it's the only one or not at this point in time, uh, that supports it is the Z690 chipset. So this is an Asus Z690 Prime Plus D4, and it is a micro ATX. You can probably just tell by the size and shape of the box. Uh, anything else in selecting the motherboard, just make sure it has the internal connectivity you need when it comes to things like the PCI slots, uh, internal USB 2 headers, USB 3 headers, USB 3.1, 3.2, Gen 2, Gen Super Hyper Speed, whatever, and the rear panel connectivity. Make sure it's got enough USB ports of, of the types that you need uh, and you know maybe a few extra just for future uh, expandability. This board supports 
DDR4 memory. Uh, so let's talk about the memory. And this will also bring up another couple of points here, but the memory that I selected in this case is Corsair's Vengeance RGB Pro. Now this is a 32 gig kit. This is two 16 gig sticks of DDR4 3600. I went with 3600. This is the exact same kit. I have two of these 32 gig kits in my computer back here and they have been rock solid. Uh, you do notice they are RGB. Uh, now this is definitely a point of contention and as you're selecting your parts, you, you go into it kind of with the, the mindset of, is this gonna be an RGB build or is it not? I originally went into this thinking that uh, my friend had no interest whatsoever in RGB, so I'd selected some different parts and we got to talking after I had bought some of this stuff and I think his words were, um, he has so many LED lights in his studio room that it looks like a Spencer's Gifts, <laughs> which uh, I did not expect. I made a bad assumption that he wasn't going to care about RGB. So I've gone back and reselected a few things. Hopefully we can get a little bit of uh, bling uh, in this build and it won't look too boring. But I think this is great RAM. Uh, it is now December of 2021. We are just on the precipice of DDR5 being um, available to us all. It is extremely expensive and extremely scarce right now. And from the things that I've seen, like Gamers Nexus has done a couple of great videos about Alder Lake and, and memory. And it didn't look like the DDR5, uh, the, the much higher clock speeds, that those are or much higher frequencies that those are capable of are just a life-changing kind of impact for Alder Lake, at least now, at least at this point. So DDR4 is much more affordable, much more available. So that's what I'm going with in this build. All right, when it comes to cooling the CPU, you've got a choice of, are you gonna air cool or are you gonna liquid cool? In the spirit of long-term reliability and trouble-free operation, I'm going to air cool this machine and I went with the Noctua NH-U12S and this is the Chromax version, this is the black version and let's see, for storage, storage is, is going to be a big deal for an audio workstation. You need fast, reliable storage. But uh, going with SSDs, which is honestly, if it's in your budget, just go SSD. <laughs> um, they are blindingly fast, especially nowadays now that PCIe Gen 4 is out, uh, which this motherboard does support. And the SSDs that support that as well. So for the kind of star of the show, as far as storage, I went with... Uh, my favorite brand for SSDs. I, I really highly trust Samsung. This is Samsung's 980 Pro, and it is PCIe Gen 4, and it's an NVMe M.2 SSD. Uh, I've used a 960 Pro and a 970 Pro for years, and I, I adore them. I, I don't think I would ever choose anything else, uh, except they get kind of expensive. And, and this is the thing with SSDs. Their prices have come down so far to where uh, smaller SSDs are are nice and affordable. We can all afford to put uh, a, a smaller SSD in our builds. But the problem is the price per gigabyte starts to kind of um, un go unreasonably up as you get larger with SSDs. So in this case, I selected a one terabyte and, and I did get this on sale. So I saved 50 bucks on this or else I probably would have just got the 512. Uh, 512 is probably large enough. So what you want to do is select an SSD as your system drive. Uh, you want to install your operating system on it and your most used, most frequently used applications. My strategy is always to use an SSD as the system drive. Uh, in this case, I was able to afford in the budget a one terabyte, which takes a lot of the pressure off of having to make those tough decisions about what do I put on this? Um, or what do I put on an external drive, or what do I put on another internal drive. And what I ended up with here as mass storage is a, a big honkin' two terabyte WD Black. This is a hard drive, traditional spinner, the spinning platters and all that. Um, if you're gonna use a hard drive, which there's nothing wrong with it, you can record many, <laughs> many channels of high resolution audio. Uh, through a SATA 3 connection onto a spinning platter um, drive, and, and it's not gonna choke. You're not gonna saturate uh, the bandwidth that these are capable of. 
uh, in most you know, audio settings, in most home recording settings at least. All in all, we got three terabytes of storage uh, in this machine. I think that is gonna be ample for a pretty long lifetime of audio recordings. And I had talked a little bit about fans. I, <laughs> I have gone back and forth on fans, uh, to say the least. And a brand that I definitely trust is Be Quiet. Uh, I've been using them in my build over here for, um, uh, what, over a year now, I think? And they have been excellent. They move a lot of air and they do it quietly. Now in this build, I wanted some RGB fans and I think that you'll find this once you start selecting parts and you sit down to build your computer. I, I think all of us, you know, we're all human. Um, I made a dumb decision. I got a couple of 140s of these Be Quiet Light Wings. These are brand new. They're pretty much the same thing as their Silent Wings 3, uh, except they have an RGB ring around them. Uh, they still perform very well, very quietly. They move a lot of air. Uh, I wanted two 140s for intake on the front of the machine, and this machine has room for one 120 on the rear. And my dumb decision was that, oh yeah, I forgot, um, this case has an opaque front panel, so it would be a waste to put some nice RGB lights, uh, RGB lit fans, where you can't see them. You can't see through the front panel. So I'll see, um, you know, maybe like top mounting a couple of these and I don't know, I'll play with it and see. But for the front intake, I have a couple of these 140s, wherever they, yeah, there they are. A couple of the 140s of the Silent Wings 3 and they are, they're, they're excellent fans. They're great. Now, when it comes to selecting fans, you know, the RGB, of course, doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter for performance, at least. But what does matter for performance is the size of the fan. And I, my rule of thumb is I always buy the largest fan that the chassis will accommodate. This chassis has cutouts and screw holes for 120s and 140s. I am going to use 140s any place that it will let me uh, because larger fans can move the same amount of air as a smaller fan while spinning more slowly. And if they're spinning more slowly, they're not creating as much noise. Uh, and I think last here, last but not least, is a power supply. Um, given our budget, th this is one spot where I, I, I definitely compromised. Uh, so this is not the greatest uh, power supply. This is a 500 watt from EVGA. Uh, it's not modular, so I believe that all the cables are permanently attached to it, but I think that's going to be okay for our purposes here. 500 watts is going to be plenty for this build, for this CPU, um, and all the components we got selected here, 500 watts will be fine. Now, if this were a gaming machine and I was going to put a modern graphics card in this build, that would be a different story. The RTX 3080s, I've got a 3080 uh, from Gigabyte, which honestly, I hate, I don't like it. Um, but it takes not only three PCIe power pins, but they have a recommendation of an 850 watt uh, power supply minimum. That's like their minimum requirement. Of course, 500 watts would not do the job for that. But I'm not gonna have, nor will this machine probably ever have just a high power graphics card in it. Uh, I got it for 50 bucks. So it was a good, uh, a good price, a good bargain. And I think for this build, it's gonna be fine. There are power supplies that have like zero RPM fans and in, in the interest of silence, you know, it, maybe once I get this plugged in, maybe that's gonna be a limitation. Maybe I'll have to go a different direction. And you know, we've gone through all this trouble to select quiet fans. Uh, it would be a shame for the power supply to kind of spoil that, you know, machines only as quiet as the quietest component. And so maybe you want to look for something like either a totally passive power supply that doesn't need active uh, cooling by a fan or something with like a zero RPM mode to where anytime the fan is not needed, it's off and only in times of really high demand, power demand, um, does the fan turn on and cool the power supply. All right, so I am going to attempt this one uh, to run off of integrated graphics. And I think that the 12th gen Intel and the motherboard that I selected, they, they do both support integrated graphics. Make sure if you're gonna go without a graphics card that both your processor and your motherboard support integrated graphics. They don't, all, all CPUs don't, uh, whether you're doing AMD or Intel, 
Uh, they, there are variants that do have integrated graphics, variants that do not. Okay, well that is the, the components we have here, I guess, now. Oh yeah, the case. Um, the, I'm not gonna, I don't have room for the case up here right now until I get it out of the box, but we selected a Lian Lee Land Cool. And what is the model number? It is the 205M, which is a micro ATX. But all right, enough jabbering about it. I guess I need to get my workspace cleared off here and hopefully um, this will go relatively smoothly. Let's get this thing put together and then let's test it out and see how it works. I'm excited, really excited, let's go. And away we go. So first let's get that CPU installed. With a 12th gen, they really only fit one way. There's a little tab that prevents you from installing it wrong. So we'll go ahead and get the RAM installed. Consult your motherboard manual to figure out what slots to use. And now for my least favorite part of any build, which is installing the CPU cooler. They have to plan for everything, so there's going to be a lot of parts you don't need in the box, and sorting through them to figure out what you do need uh, can be a little challenging. Just read the instructions carefully, and you'll be alright. Don't torque everything down super tight. Here on the 12th gen, the Noxio cooler instructions recommended the five dots of uh, thermal paste there, so... Now we'll get the cooler on, get the fan attached, rotate the fan a little bit to um, make sure the cable comes off in a nice tidy position close to the socket on the motherboard. Now it's time for the SSD install and the world's smallest screw. And now we'll go ahead and get the case out of the box, we'll get all the panels taken off, Get the uh, goodie box out, get the front panel connectors ready to go. Take off all the stock fans. Put the I.O. shield in. Do some motherboard reading to figure out where all the standoffs go based on the format of motherboard I'm using. So, test fit number one here. Uh, eh, this one was a no-go. I'm gonna have to pull the motherboard back out because one of those standoffs was in the wrong spot. Which I'm discovering about now. And, uh, went and grabbed the needle nose pliers. And that little, that little thing was stubborn. Those needle nose would, all they were doing was creating metal shavings. They weren't getting it out. So now, break out the heavy artillery, the Kennypex Cobras. You know something's being stubborn when you gotta break out the Cobras. Next, we're gonna go ahead and get those front panel fans put in. I went with the, um, Silent Wings 3 as front intake as planned. It's a couple of op mounting options. I went with the rubber standoff mounts and the plastic pins, which did actually create a little bit of a conflict with the magnetic dust filter on the front, but nothing an exacto knife couldn't solve. Test fit number two there. Yeah, that was a no-go as well. It was gonna be a lot easier to go ahead and get the fans installed first not have to work around all of the heat shields and shrouds on the motherboard. So we're doing the 140 millimeter light wings as top exhaust and the 120 millimeter light wings as rear exhaust. Test fit number three! And I think this one's gonna stick this time. All right, let's get the motherboard all secured down. Get all the screws in place there. No, uh, no small feet. Those screws are really tiny and it's kind of hard to get into some of those crevices. Now, doing some of the front panel connectors and hey, this is just a note to Planet Earth, uh, just a request. Hey, can we all just come up with one standardized uh, connector for the front panels and not have to deal with a bunch of little individually fiddly little tiny impossible to place pins? That'd be great. Let's get let's get to work on that. What do you say? And doing a little bit of cable management here, which you can't see due to the camera angle, but take my word for it. And I think now it's time to get the power supply installed, which at this point I wish I had done earlier because there's just a lot of junk in the way you can see here. Oh yeah, I gotta get those fans. Uh, both the power and the RGB connections to the fans plugged into the motherboard. Consult the uh, motherboard manual to figure out where all that stuff goes. 
And some more cable management, some more fiddling with RGB cables. Now it's time for the power supply. And yeah, about right here, you can kind of see, that's, that's a tight fit. There's a lot of stuff in the way. Probably should have done that earlier in the build process. But hey, it worked out all right. I have that dual four pin CPU power connector way up in the corner. My goodness, that was tough. The ATX, that 24 pin ATX is never, that, that's always the hardest connector for me because it takes a lot of force to plug it in. And the motherboard, I always feel like I'm gonna break it. So I did eventually get those plugged in. Now it's time for the hard drive. I love the hard drive mount on this chassis. Uh, there's some rubber standoffs to isolate it from the, the, the chassis itself. So I ran some SATA power, SATA data to it. Yeah, some rudimentary cable management. And now let's plug a monitor, a keyboard, and a mouse in. Let's try a test boot and let's see if this thing works. Fingers crossed. Let's see. Pop it on here. And nothing. Oh, hey. Hey, look at that. We have at least power. Okay, so at least we get power. Hey, and look back here. It posted. It posted. Woo -hoo -hoo -hoo. Oh my goodness. Okay. Okay, so here we are. It's actually a few weeks later. Uh, the holidays happened, and uh, this is just my first opportunity to sit down and record kind of the epilogue to this to show you how it turned out. This is actually my last day with this computer. Uh, I got to pack it up, send it to my friend. I was actually supposed to do that today, but uh, sorry, buddy. It's going to be a day late. <laughs> but let's take a quick look just visually how it turned out. And here it is. I think it looks like a million bucks. I, I really like it. So you can see like those silent wings or uh, light wings fans, like they just put off such a great consistent light. And it is, of course, it's running right now, as you can see. And I mean, it is just dead silent. Well, maybe not dead silent, but here at idle, the noise level is so quiet. It's just amazing. I love these fans. That cooler, uh, this is that Noctua cooler, is doing an amazing job. All in all, I think it looks great. Here's the, uh, the top. I thought this case was a pleasure to build in. Uh, there's lots of cable management options and everything. And, you know, as you can see, you know, I'm definitely not the best cable manager uh, in the world. Uh, you know, especially that 24 pin ATX for the uh, motherboard, but any place that I needed a cable to go, there was a convenient cutout in the case so I could run it nice and neat. I have to say the temperatures, this thing are amazing here. Let's take a look. Uh, I've got core temp, which is not the best, uh, temperature monitor software out there, but I kind of like it. And you can see these, these cores are currently at idle at 22, 23, 24, 25 degrees C uh, Celsius. Right now, it's 71 degrees Fahrenheit in this room, and that's 21.6, so that's almost 22 degrees C. This CPU is idling, <laughs> like almost at ambient temperature. That is amazing. So temperatures have been great. I did some stress testing, uh, like with Cinebench. Uh, it, uh, actually, here, let me pull that up. We had one or two cores uh, that topped out like at 85, 86, 87 degrees Celsius, which is about the max that I would ever be comfortable with, uh, you know, even maybe just a little warmer. But that was, you know, under worst case scenario of running Cinebench, the full test, it takes about 20 or 30 minutes or so to make it to that whole test. So running full bore, 100% utilization for 20 or 30 minutes and just one or two cores topping out at 86, 87. And so, we scored a 22,189, which I think, uh, if I remember correctly, that outscores my Ryzen 9 3900X uh, in my machine, which makes me a little jealous, but hey, it's fine, it's fine, it's just a number. But it is a number that gives us at least some sort of uh, reference point, some sort of idea of how this, um, how this CPU um, it scales, you know. You know, it way outscored a uh, first generation Threadripper 
and it's within a couple of hundred points of a uh, Intel Xeon, um, which is a 24 core 48 thread. I, I mean, I, I couldn't ask any more. I'm very happy with this uh, 12th gen Alder Lake uh, i7. Uh, over in the single core, let's take a quick look. Yeah, we scored an 1876 in single core. That's, that's a, a market improvement over the 11th gen i7s. The SSD, the Samsung 980 Pro, scored, um, it had over 6,400 megabytes per second uh, sequential read in the one meg here. Uh, that's, that's like out of this world as far as I'm concerned. Uh, on the other hand, the Western Digital Drive, uh, you know, it's fine. Um, according to, what is it, the uh, user benchmark, you know, it was performing like in the high 90s percentile. Um, so it, it's performing as well as it can. It, it tops out at reading um, maybe about like 200 meg per second, which is, you know, just not great, but it is a hard drive. And actually, I have a good example of why you may want to load uh, sample libraries, like, like why you might want to go all entirely SSD if you can afford it, if it's in your build's budget. And I have created a sample project in Reaper uh, here. And so let's take a quick look. I'm going to open this project and then open Task Manager to watch it. But I, I can hear the hard drive going. It's loading samples off that drive. Let's look at Task Manager. And we can see our memory. I'm like, okay, yeah, we're loading stuff into memory. We're starting to, starting to hog it up here. And if we go to the disk here, so we can see we're reading at 130, 140, 160 meg per second. But we are still loading. We're still loading. And if we go over to Reaper, uh, let me get rid of the nag screen. Okay, close that. And we'll take a look at Superior Drummer 3 here. We can see we got 59, 6100 meg. Okay, it, 64, 27 meg. Okay, so we're using 6.4 gigabytes of RAM for this uh, instance of Superior Drummer. And we can see our, our memory kind of leveled off here. But we can see the uh, read speed dropped off here. So, you know, that took a while. I mean, this is showing us the last 60 seconds of activity. So it took, you know, a minute to load six and a half gig worth of samples uh, from a sample library. So if you're doing things like, like Superior Drummer with the, the fully decked out, absolute, all the samples you can make it load uh, kind of scenario, or maybe if you're doing something like an orchestral library where you've got many, many instruments and many velocity layers, uh, you can kind of see, I mean, it still, it took a minute. I mean, it's a minute of our lives, but on an SSD, that would have, that would have happened uh, much, much faster. Unfortunately, my time over the holidays here did not allow for me to just record a full music project through this, which was one of my goals with this build. But since today's my last day with it, um, I'm not going to be able to do that. So I'm sorry if that's a disappointment. You don't get to see how it, it really reacts under kind of real world circumstances of recording audio. Okay, I brought up an um, instance of Latency Mon, and let's just see what the DVC latency is like. I'm just going to click this and let it run for a while as I jabber on here and we'll uh, check back in on it here in a little bit. I noticed, um, so we are running Windows 11 here, and that was just kind of another thing. It's inevitable that eventually my friend's gonna have to move to Windows 11 here within the next four years or so. So it's always a bit of a risk going with uh, such a new and young uh, operating system. You know, you've got considerations like driver compatibility, uh, application compatibility. Uh, but honestly, I haven't had any problems yet. Uh, it's been smooth. Uh, I've been using a, uh, an SSL 2 Plus. So at very least, SSL's uh, drivers uh, seem to be ready for Windows 11. Uh, Reaper runs fine. All the plugins I've used so far run fine. Uh, so I I'm, I'm optimistic that Windows 11 is going to be a, a good platform moving forward. All right, so we got about two and a half minutes of Latency Mon running here. Uh, everything's in the green so far. You know, two and a half minutes isn't necessarily long enough. If you're going to run Latency Mon, I would um, just leave it running for, I don't know, an hour or so. And honestly, I would only even worry about running it if you're experiencing problems and you're trying to, to narrow down where that problem is. Uh, one of the things that I harp on a lot when talking about audio computers is fans and fan control. 
Um, with my last build, I spent a lot of time in the BIOS, uh, just carefully designing fan curves, you know, fan speed versus temperature, and the fan control um, is pretty good in the motherboard's um, application, uh, which it's not a great application. Uh, for ASUS, it's called Armory Crate, and it's kind of their catch-all software. Motherboard manufacturers are, they, I, it boggles my mind that they make some of the most sophisticated and complicated um, devices that mankind has ever conceived of. But they can't write a desktop application to save their lives. <laughs> I don't understand it. They're hardware people, I guess they're not software people. But the software always leaves something to be desired. And that brings me, I think, to my final point here, and that is with lighting, with RGB lighting. RGB lighting is a mess. It is an absolute disaster across all brands. And it's because each brand has their own app to control their own uh, gear. And it's really frustrating that there isn't one central program, that there isn't one central standard that a program can take advantage of. So you could just have one place, one program to open up, see anything in your computer that lights up and have total control of it right right there. It looks cool, and I love the idea of being able to customize a computer over time, change my mind oh, on color schemes and everything, but it is, it's a freaking mess right now. It's a disaster, and it's senseless. And nobody, none of the companies seem interested in making it any better. So that, just a word of warning, if you're gonna get into RGB lighting, it's gonna be frustrating to set up, and more than likely it's gonna require having a, an application running in the background all the time. Okay, well, that's just about all I can think of uh, to go over here today. Uh, sorry, I'm kind of in a hurry. I got to get this thing packed up. So my apologies if I've just glossed over anything important or I, I'm sure as soon as I stop recording, uh, turn off my cameras, I'm going to think of another 10 things I should have said. Thank you so much for watching. I really, really appreciate it. And I think that's going to do it for me this time. And I'll see you guys again next time.